What's up, Fungal Associates? Welcome to Completely Arbitrary. It's the podcast about trees and other related topics. I am one of your hosts. My name is Alex Croson, and of course, I am here with host number dose, Mr. KC Clap. Well, that's me, Alex. Thanks for having me once again. It's a pleasure to be here. I don't know how we find time every week. You know what? Sometimes we don't, Case. <laughs> that's true, and we find extra time in other weeks. That's right. Speaking of, we did that last week, the week before, and the week before. Yeah, we've had a busy couple weeks. <laughs> yes, we have. And you know what? I am actually I'm really happy about it. I feel the best when we're busy and yeah. We are in the middle of it, but kind of on the front end, it's almost like we're surfing on a wave of work. Yeah. Where we're not getting engulfed by the wave. We are on top of it, moving with it at the speed of sound. Wow, that's beautiful. I'm pretty sure that's how fast waves move. <laughs> the speed of sound. To be sound. very clear. Maybe I'm just trying to really add in as much uh, audio... Uh, audio medium propaganda as I can in sure. this. Sure. I mean, yeah. I'll probably add some um, This American Lifestyle sound effects. Uh, do they still do sound effects? You're thinking Radio Lab. Radio Lab. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah this yeah. American Life, it's more just like, hi. It's like the two podcasts I know. This is Casey Clapp. Besides uh, Doughboys. We're talking again about a tree. Casey, you and I are both kind of gearing up for uh, going out of town. This is what That's happens. Right. We, get, we, we plan trips. Yeah. We have the good fortune of, of owning our own business so that we get to sort of make our own schedule. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. With that comes, you know, well, you can't just leave and no work gets done. It's the, it's the, uh, it's, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with it. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have someone else over there being like, Hey, uh, we're going to pay, we're going to take care of this podcast when you guys are gone. Is that okay? Right. We don't have a team of people making this show. Unfortunately, it's just well, you and me. Yeah. Well, no, they, they come and go. They come and go. Yeah. But we, anyway, I'm going on a trip. a lot of people. That's true. The turnover is crazy. Uh, I am going on a trip. You are going on a trip. You just yep. got back from a trip. We, yep. We're just doing lots of things. All the time. But you know what? For the next hour and 15 minutes, probably more like an hour and 30, Where you and I, all we have to do right now is talk about a tree. And be present here. That's right. On this microphone. Yeah. With you. Be here now. And to t- and we're going to be here now in order to talk about <laughs> the Canary <laughs> Island Laurel. What are you laughing I at? I was really hoping you could say, and in order to be here now, we are going to see you in a second. <laughs> <laughs> we have to go to a break. <laughs> There's a break right there. <laughs> now we're talking about the Canary Island Laurel, Casey. That is true, yes. And that is the name that I have chosen right. to use for this. So apologies to everyone who is looking on your feed and you see now Canary Island this and Canary Island that. You might also know this tree as the Portuguese Laurel. You actually probably don't okay never mind i take it back now all right let's uh, this this is a little bit into it this is going to be explanation for you for me and for everybody else and then we're going to go to break and then we're going to go to break so i initially heard about the trees that we're talking about from some friends that visited tenerife i think either tenerife or madeira islands that are off of the coast of africa and very southern europe portugal Mm. and they said it's this really cool amazing forest so i was like okay i'm going to look this up and i started googling it it's this Laura Silva. Right. Laurel so, Forest. Exactly. Literally. literally speaking. So I was like, okay, there's got to be, it's got to be a Laurel. Oh my God. Is this like what Portuguese Laurel grows like? But oh. it's not a dumb sh- hedge on the, wow. the side of, you know, things on, you know, our roads. Did you almost call it a dumb shit? I might have. <laughs> this tree's a dumb shit. Anyway, so I was like, okay, well, what tree is this? Yeah. And I had this this in my heart. I was hoping it was going to be a redemptive quality about the Portuguese laurel, wow. which we actually know scientifically as Prunus lusitanica, which is, uh, it's a cherry laurel is what the they're called. The lucifer cherry. It's the lucifer cherry. Devil's so, cherry. That's what we had this entire day like ready to go for. That was the last we spoke. Exactly. That was the latest update. Then I went off, did some research, and said, we got to make sure we get this right. I'm not just going to uh-huh. research a tree and be like, yeah, it grows on that island. End of story. Now, it does grow on this island or these islands. However, the trees that we are really talking about yeah. are true laurels. Wow. Of which there are three. Three species of laurel? Three species of true laurel. And barely even that. We used to think there's just two. And this was a subspecies of one. Is that is this like a true cedar thing where it's yes. like these are the actual laurel in the family of laurels yes. or whatever? Okay. You got that exactly right. Yeah. So there's laurel, which 
which is in Loris. You probably are familiar with the bay laurel, that mm. one you put in uh, in your soups and things. Sure. Loris nobilis. That is the one, that's the, the Linnaeus-named archetype. That is laurel. laurel. Okay. Yes. Now, there are two very closely related species that exist. One is the one that we are talking about here today, otherwise known as the Canary Island laurel or Loris Nova Canariensis. And the other one is Loris Azorica, which oh. is of the Azores. Wow. So the the Portugal Portuguese laurel is not a real laurel. It is not True a real laurel. laurel. Exactly. But we use laurel. It's a huge family. Like there's a bunch of things. In fact, what eucalyptus is in the laurel family? Right. And it's like a, it's one of those families that has like a bunch of other types of plants yeah. too. Yeah. But for whatever like reason, rose. We yeah, but this is this is different in that we always call them laurels even though they're not that. It's kind of like orchids. There's things in the orchid family. There's things that are orchids, but there's so many different genre of orchids yeah where there's no like true orchid that's like orchid something you know like orchid, cedrus orchid. yeah right exactly there's true cedars in the genus cedrus but there's no like very closely related cedar like things that are essentially cedars but different like this really weird way hmm. this there are the three species of true laurels in the genus loris that Every other thing that we call a laurel is named after. Interesting. But a lot of those are also in the laurel family. Well, this is this is just typical, isn't it? It's just goddamn typical. <laughs> so we'll be talking about the Canary Island laurel today, class. Yes. But we must do so after a break. We will be right back with Completely Arbitrary. Welcome back. I want my welcome back, welcome back. Welcome <laughs> I was back. like, yeah, that sounded really good. <laughs> uh, today, we are talking, oh, by, to Completely Arbitrary, by uh, the way. Yes, yeah, so we are talking to Completely Arbitrary. Completely, <laughs> completely. It's so good to see you again. How is your family? Casey, today we are talking the Canary Island Laurel. Yes. Which grows on the Canary Islands. It does. Very well done. Along with the Canary Island Palm that we talked about last week. Yes. And for those of you in L.A., you all have been waiting for us to say pine. We are not talking about the Canary Island Pine. Right. Another time. Maybe we'll do a trilogy and, and talk about all these three in a row. Now, it's almost as if Alex is inside my brain. <laughs> We're just going to talk nothing about yeah. any other islands for the next month strictly Canary Island. A little behind the scenes there. Yeah. Casey, let's imagine as we do every episode that you and I are oh. trekking through the jungle <laughs> on the Canary Islands. You're having a great time. I am on death's door and we come across <laughs> some Canary Island laurels. Let's ID this tree. Okay. I'm glad you asked. So this is, as we said, Loris Novo Canariensis, which in... Latin really just means New Canariensis. Okay. So, uh, Novo Homus is what you would be called if you were a new man uh, in the uh, in the, like ancient Rome. Hmm. It just means essentially uh, you either pulled yourself up by your yeah you pulled yourself up by your bootstraps. So hmm. you were just like yeah I had nothing and now I am a senator. Or you had you got like you got a divorce. Um, yeah, you are now Novo Homus. Well done. You You're know? a new man. Yeah. So it's really fun to, to think about that. So you see it in Latin, Novo Canariensis, it kind of really, it, I, it's kind of frustrating because I would say Novo Canariensis is like, it's the new Canary Island laurel. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, where's the old one? Where's the, yeah. Is it the old laurel from the Canary Islands or is this the new Canary Island and this is the tree that grows on that? Oh, you interesting. You know what I mean? Like, there's two different ways to interpret that. Yeah, it depends on where the comma is. Yeah. <laughs> so, I personally believe that they named it that because they're they're basically saying, yeah, this is a new species that's different from the Azor species. I got you. That's what my thought is. Okay. But, either way, it is a species of tree that is in Loris. As we noted, that is the family of the true laurels. Now, the thing about true laurels is that they are generally small, multi-stem trees. Okay. I'll give you an example. Like we a, just went, like shrub-like. Yeah, shrub-like. They send up kind of multiple shoots. They have not one stem that's connected and branches very low. They usually have multiple new stems that come up from the ground in like a little grouping. Interesting. There's a really great one at Hoyt Arboretum where the tree itself is probably... 
maybe 15 or 20 feet tall. Mm. It creates a really nice dense shade underneath it. It's a beautiful little tree, but as you get closer to it, you realize it's just many new stems uh, that are all coming up doing this one thing. Interesting. So in terms of it being a tree, 90% of the time, meh. I don't know if we could quite get it there. You and I, we just went to our favorite, uh, essentially arbitrary pod sponsored shop across the way. As you walk in, there is this nice little kind of patio space. Uh-huh. That little patio is lined with Loris Nobilis. That's right. The Bay Laurel. You could walk over there right now, snap one of those off and make a nice soup on this lovely fall day. I often do. Do you really? Yes. Ah, I love just snapping on one off and just like crushing it in my hands <laughs> and smelling my hands it's like superstar. So good. Yeah. It's just, it's like you're getting a kick out of something. It's yeah. like Sweet Bay is what it is. Yeah, yeah. It's a quintessential smell, isn't it? It's great. So this tree is very closely related to that tree, okay. the one that we are talking about. And it generally is a bigger, taller variety because our species, which I think is really cool, grows in this forest that's called the Laura Silva. And it's these mid-montane forests that grow up where it becomes very humid Mm. on these islands. So if you are walking around uh, and you see this tree planted, it's probably going to be a kind of sprawling-ish, multi-stemmed, shrubby thing. Mm. You go to these forests and they are these single-stemmed, gargantuan trees up to like Ah. Like I think I read twenty to forty meters in crazy spots. Like in the in the um the silva the yeah. laurel silva. Yeah, in these in this forest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, okay. it can get huge. So they just need their they just need the right uh they just need to be free and yeah. then they can really thrive. Exactly. Don't now, box them in. Just yeah. Well, it's it's a thrive, but also we're going to talk about it a little bit more. Wow. It's a pretty unique situation that they're growing in. Okay. And they've been growing in that unique situation for something like. Some of them, 600 years. Jeez. Yeah. This this is a tree that you look at, and it kind of was like, that's weird. Oh, my God. Hmm. That's weird. The whole thing about it's really weird. And Interesting. I'm, I just, I cannot wait to tell you all about it. Well, Casey, let's get into it. So, uh, generally speaking, it gets between about 15 and 25 meters tall. Oh, meters. Yeah. So, good. you can get up to about 100 feet-ish. That's like pretty good. It's going to be in that area, right? Yeah. So, pretty pretty extraordinary. <laughs> Maybe a little bit closer to 80 feet. Big trees. And they grow upwards because this whole forest is very dark and dense and very much in like the world's most perfect conditions. Yeah. So, everything grows up. If into- you want to survive... You got to go straight up. You got to go up. So they've been going up for a long time. They generally have a round, a rounded crown. They have this cool stem though. And this is something that I like about both uh, the one that we know and love that's planted around here, Mm Loris nobilis and Novo canariensis. Yeah. It's bark has lenticels, but it's kind of a gray tan bark. Oh, wow. Casey's turned his computer. Will you zoom in on that? Uh, I can. You always say you I, can't. Oh, but yeah. you have finally... <laughs> Check that out. <laughs> Hit command plus a couple times, Case. Oh, God, Alex. Do okay, it for command, me. Come on, man. Command, command plus. Yeah, baby. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> Is that it? Is that what you want? Jeez. It's the... It's the okay, for <laughs> the for our audio listeners, it's the co- cookies. <laughs> yeah, uh, the... The picture has gotten no bigger. Yeah, this just isn't all working. The things around I, the picture. I, I, I do see it, Casey. Uh, <laughs> I also uh, have a computer right in front of me. You know, yeah, we got to get you. Uh, we got to get you to use computers one of these yeah, days. Yeah, I'll. I'll uh, you know what? I have my rotary phone, and that's good enough for yeah, me. Okay, I guess that's all you can ever ask. I for. can call Cheryl on Sunday night. <laughs> we'll that's that's all I need about the newest picture film. <laughs> so it has it's like this gray bark, but its lenticels are almost like warts that come out. Wow! So it's like has this very warty texture going down with these lenticels that kind of pop out and kind of develop slight horizontalness to it. So they're like. They're not exactly a central point, and that's it. They're kind of points where they look like they've been smeared a little bit to the left and the right. Yeah. So they have this like interesting, very like horizontally defined texture on this vertical column that is, you know, gray tan kind of thing. It's not completely unlike, uh, you know, prunus bark. Yeah, I don't think it's. I don't think it's very far away. But yeah. keep in mind, of course, this is Loris, so they're not even well, closely related. I understand that. Okay. But, but I'm saying, you know, we we've talked about how. Uh, 
uh, prunus yeah. that has all of the false the lentils going that way. Yeah. yeah, or the doesn't isn't prunus the family with all the false laurels and stuff? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah. yes. Correct. So I guess I was just making a mental connection. This also looks like its fake cousin. I think everything looks like Loris. That's what I am coming to terms wow. with today. Okay. Because it is not the only tree that grows in this forest, but we're only going to describe one, and then we'll talk about the others in a second. You know what Loris says? Is that, I just got one of those faces. I just got one of those faces. Must be a good looking guy. <laughs> anyway, that's what I say when anyone says that. Yeah. And they're like, hey, you look just like some other person. I'm like, hey, you must be a good looking guy. That's that's classic. Very classic. A classic yeah, bit. I feel good because it also lets everyone laugh and walk away. Because I'm like, <laughs> this information means very mm-hmm. little to me, but thank you. <laughs> So it is a, generally, of course, it's going to have a nice tall straight trunk when it's growing out in the big nice forest. It does have suckers though. That's the same thing that the other one has. Suckers. It sends up. A sucker is a shoot that comes up from the roots. Oh. It just pops up. There's okay. no good reason that it's called a sucker. I and mean, I don't think it's necessarily bad. It's just yeah. a thing that a lot of plants do. Okay. So because it's growing up in the understory, it, it really is not going to be putting out a lot. They're not going to be doing a whole lot. And of course, leaves, if they don't produce enough to survive, then the tree's like, mm, I'm not going to feed you, and they die. Yeah, it seems like a like a, a financial risk that the tree yeah. doesn't need to make. Exactly. It'll take the risk for a second, and it'll it'll pop that bud. But if that bud doesn't start producing, yeah. then it just stops feeding them. Smart. So it will. It's all. Its leaves are alternately arranged down the stem, and they're very small. And they have what's called a a drip tip. So they're generally oh. speaking, they are about uh, maybe maybe four inches long. They have wavy margins, but the margins are also very smooth, so they're entire. Cool. So they do have these waves, so they undulate. Yeah, we talked about like a ridged chip. Yes, exactly. Kind of yeah. like that. Yeah, it's just like on that outside. Yeah. It's not very symmetrical, though. I don't think uh, the... No. I mean, it's symmetrical, but the waves themselves aren't happening at a uniform okay. part, sure. you know? Okay, yeah. Yeah. And these are also waves looking from the top. So there's crenulations, which would be like little half circles around the edge of a mm-hmm. leaf. So that'd be a crenate margin. Okay. Versus a serulate margin, where those are like sharp and serrated wow. like a knife. Okay. This has neither of those, but if you look at it from the top or the side, then... It it looks like it's created these waves, so you you can really tell the difference. It's like the leaf uh, got a little bit wet, and now it's just a little wrinkly on yeah. the side. You know, yeah, that's what it looks we, like. To we've me. also talked about those waves kind of looking like the the leaf has a little too too much extra material. Yeah, but it jams it in anyway. Yeah, so it yeah. kind of creates like a a, 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 a pleat. Yes, exactly. That's the, you got it right. Yeah. So it's a uh, they're really nice leaves, but they are they're simple. They're very leathery. They're evergreen leaves, like most of the things in this forest. They are maybe like I said, four inches long with this long tip. Like the tip comes and then goes whoop, and then immediately comes out. We call it a abruptly accumulant tip. And so you said it has a drip tip. Exactly. And this is something that I've read about for a long time, and everyone says, "Oh yeah, a drip tip like the laurel forests." And I'm like, what does that mean? Oh. What, why is this? Why does everyone just say it like it's so Man, commonly understood? We run in completely different circles. <laughs> well, yeah, this is this is the bar talk that I see. Going to a conference, everyone's just like, yeah, you know, you get it. And Alex, uh, yeah, we, we, that is true. Well, so these funny. are, uh, there's one last thing that I thought was curious about these leaves is they have a gland that is situated right where wow. the midrib and the veins come out. A gland. Yeah, so I can't zoom in this. You're going to have to click on this yourself. Yeah, I will. But it looks almost like a blister where the central main vein in the leaf, Uh wherever it has a secondary lateral vein come off, there's like a little, like a little ball, like a little ballooned space. Wow. Just right there. And that is apparently a gland that this uh, this one has, and others that are closely related to it, or that you might confuse it with, do not have that. Interesting. So, there's good your ID I- characteristic. Good ID. Now this is. Oh, I see that case. Yeah, okay, you do. Wow. No, this is great. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it is like a little blister. Uh, yeah, I saw it and I was like, well, that's a very good thing to note. And then I kept reading, and it says, a good thing to note is this. Uh- <laughs> I'm like, hey, nice. <laughs> so now, of course. If you squeeze and you crush these leaves, Alex, you're going to get a lovely sweet scent. Oh, yeah. Is it like other, uh, is it like bay laurel? It is. It's very, okay. very similar to bay laurel. I get a little confused because we co- in co- in the culinary world, you uh-huh. call that bay. Like yes. bay leaf. Yes, not it's a bay leaf. laurel leaf, right? Right, yeah. That's a good point. But I bay is why. like the prefix. Yeah, it's a bay laurel. So. Sweet bay. 
So I have so other laurels smell like what we call bay. Uh, at least the true laurels. I will say laurel is bay. Laurel is bay. What's okay, up? Okay, I got you. Thanks, Alex. Um, that so the flowers that then pop out are these very small little white flowers that pop out in the axle. So where the leaves are connected, that's where these little flower heads come out. And they're these teeny tiny little fragrant white, yellowish, greenish flowers that come out in the springtime. They look a little utility. Yeah, they kind of do. They kind of are. Yeah. It's not they're the not main thing. They're not that attractive. Thing. They don't really jump out. They're not like, whoa. Yeah. Yeah, they're just there. You have to look really close to find them. So I think they're, they're like spectacular for insect level things that's my guess like an insect would be like blown away by it exactly it's at the scale that an insect's like now that is nice yeah but you or i yeah we'd look at and be like what is this a flower made for ants (laughs) they're like yes we love it yes this is great we love this back (laughs) off person yeah since when was that a bad thing yeah (laughs) yeah yeah you know what zoolander really didn't have the the ant um I guess it would be the ant lobby down yeah. there, making sure that everyone knew that the ants okay. need schools. Too. It was a different time, Casey. It was a different time. He we also wore so blackface in that movie. <laughs> yeah, well, that was uh, because he was in the mines. Right. Again, a different time. <laughs> uh, so you're not going to see those flowers, Alex, on every tree because it's a dioecious Aha, species. Aha, two houses. Two houses. One makes the pollen, one has the seeds. Cool. And that is how they've separated their duties. Fair enough. Again, it's another time. Nowadays, any kind of plant can, yeah. be, can do whatever it wants. I any plant can be monetious. That. Yeah, thank you. And I believe that down the lines, if, if we keep fighting, someday we will find a monetious laurel. <laughs> we will. It's just completely gone rogue. Uh-huh. You know what? The society is just suffocating. <laughs> I reckon it will happen with most plants, don't you think? Actually, it's something I've been meaning to research, uh, is that there, there are theories, and people have asked this question, mm. like, why are there monetious versus dioecious trees? Yeah. What is the, uh, the evolutionary basis? of making that choice one way or the other. Well, it's to prevent from self-pollinating, right? Yes. I believe that has to do with it, but it also kind of puts all your eggs in certain baskets. Yeah. So if if you think about it in terms of millions of years, that could be a really bad, bad thing. Totally. Where if for whatever reason you are growing nowhere near the opposite sexed tree, it could be a big challenge. Yeah, evolutionarily, it's not that smart. Yeah, so someone brought this up as a as 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 an evolutionary thing, and I was like, oh my god, I keep forgetting. Literally, everything is evolution. So why did this happen? Right. So I will get back to you on that, Alex. It wouldn't happen with no for no reason. Exactly. It would develop because of some pressure mm-hmm. that essentially said this is a more better way for me to compete in this exact area right. in this exact condition and very successfully. Clearly, so right. And I believe it's been followed, maybe not the monoecious versus dioecious, dioeciousness, but every other thing about this tree is just the the archetype for what all the other trees around here do. Wow. Now, before we get too far, the fruit is a fleshy droop. Oh, good. Again. I was hoping it would be. What was our last tree? It was a palm, and it had a fleshy droop. Wow. Date palm. It's something about the Canary Islands, huh? I guess you're right, because Alex... <laughs> Oh my God. What? This feels like the right time because you know what? Oh Our God. tree, it's great. It's got a nice little seed in this little thing. It looks Uh-oh. like a little droop. It's, you know, okay, cool. It's a little blackish. It looks like a little olive. Where are you going with good. this? They, <laughs> on this island, on these islands, uh-huh. they have at least four or three other trees that grow in almost the exact same way. Like, oh. I mean, down to a T. Including fleshy droops? Yeah, exactly. They have fleshy droops because they're in the same family. They're very, very close in terms of relation. In fact, one is nested within the other. So it's like this one is a derivative of that one. Oh. These are maybe derivatives of the actual laurel. But I didn't uh, sadly get down all the way into that granular of detail in terms of like the uh, the phenology of all these different laurel family plants. Okay. On this island, they have three other kinds of trees. And they call them the same kind of forest. So you have the till Laura Silva, which is where one of the biggest trees is called the till tree, which is Akatia Fotens. Hmm. Now, not to be confused with Akatia, or rather Ocotillo, which is a very spiny, horrifying plant that grows down in Mexico and okay. like the southwest United States. Different. 
Yeah, it's just like they look like sugar cane with no leaves and only spikes. Hell yeah. They're horrifying. Great. <laughs> I've ran into a few of them. They're not they're not fun. Oh jeez. Um so not <clears throat> to be confused with that. This is called the till tree, the till Laura Silva. Then there's the Venhatico Laura Silva, which is the Madeira mahogany, which is Persia indica. Now, are you familiar with Persia, Alex? Persia. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I am. Is that mm. named after Persia? Mm, it might be, yes, but for no good reason. Well, I guess I don't know. I, I didn't look into it. I don't. I guess I don't know. I don't Persia know. Persia yeah. is the genus that we know better as the avocado. Oh. So this is a teeny tiny little avocado. Fleshy native droops. To these funny little islands. Wow, how about that? Then there is the Barbusano Laura Silva, which is, this is the scientific name. I'll give you the whole scientific name. A-P-O-L-L-O-N-I-A-S. Apol- Apollonius. Which I believe is the name of like an ancient Greek thinker or something like that. I've got Apollonia's Pizzeria in Los Angeles. Yeah, you're close. Let's uh, <laughs> let's go let's go beyond that. So here's the epithet. See, this is why this is genus versus species. Uh, now we're gonna get down to it. Let's get down to All it. All right, it's B A R B U J A N A. Barbahana. Is that what you would say? I would say I would say Apollonius Barb Barbuhana. Okay, that's what we're gonna call it. There is your other one. So they literally call it a Barbusana Laura Silva. Oh, yeah. So all of these, every single one of these plants is also in the laurel family. Okay. They also have evergreen leaves with a small little drip tip. Yeah. And they have the same little droop berries that are coming out. They're not technically berries. They're droops. I know. You get it. So their little fruit that's popping out looks almost exactly the same, but you can see differences in like how it's botanically set up. So we know they're different species. They're different genre entirely. Wow. But they're all within the same family. And they all found a home on these islands. They did. Now, I'm glad you asked. How did these islands come to be, Alex? Well, well I guess you said Casey. When God wants to create a new island. Mm-hmm. Uh, he starts a volcanic reaction. Yeah, by way down. by plucking a hair out of Satan's head, which <laughs> makes him angry. Ooh, and then <laughs> going, yeah, now that is a story we're telling kids. Uh, yeah, so these islands are all volcanic. They, okay, they came out of um, I think a hot spot is what I read. So similar to like how Hawaii has happened, mm-hmm. where there's just like this hot spot in the crust, right? There's also a bunch of tectonic plates right there where there's the Africa plate, there's the European plate, and there's a North American plate. And there's also stuff going on uh, in terms of them splitting. So right now, uh, I believe the Atlantic Ocean is getting larger by mm. X amount of uh, centimeters every year because the the plate in the very middle is slowly but surely getting wider. Oh. So because that's happening, there's still volcanism Uh-oh. all over the place. So volcanism. these... 20,000 foot volcanoes. Wow. That's what we're dealing with, but we only see the top a uh, couple thousand feet. Oh, it's like icebergs. Exactly. All the rest of it is underneath the ocean. Interesting. Apparently, one of the volcanoes on these islands, I can't uh-huh. remember which one, it would be the third largest volcano. I think when they were comparing like underwater ocean kind of volcano. Yeah. Because they're measuring it from the ground where it starts. Sure. Not the level of the ocean. But it's not, it's not on, it's not on the ground so it's like yeah it's under or i guess it has ground i, I don't really know how nah. they make that decision you know where is the ground i'm in not the interested to find out <laughs> alex actually i got a great wikipedia article let me just <laughs> read this. now so this is a giant volcanic kind of arc archipelago here's another question oh geez how do you pronounce that I say archipelago. All right. This is what I'm going to try to say, but for whatever reason. But I like brain, archipelago. That's my, fun. My brain cannot decide which it's, one. It sounds more Greek. Archipelago sounds like uh, okay. a Greek philosopher. All right. You have Plato, you have Socrates, you have archipelago. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so are these active volcanoes, Casey? Um, they are still. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Not as active. They're not like spewing out lava, but they're still doing stuff they're here They're not there. dormant. No, I don't think technically. Maybe a few are because as hot spots work, there's a hot spot that exists as the plates move over the top top of it yeah. hot spot stays there which is why hawaii is like slowly pulled out oh, you know geez. it's because it used to be there <sighs> then it moved over a little bit and then a new volcano started coming up so you have this 
long chain. You know, the, the Earth is actually quite terrifying it's when you qu- think about it. Yeah, quite dynamic, too. And it's it's sort of like an evil miracle that we're all here, isn't <laughs> it, it? Yeah, it really is. That's um, a nice way to put it. <laughs> Our lives are just evil miracles. Casey, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I have kind of a volcano question. Ooh. I know you're a bit of an expert. Yeah, yeah, what do we got? <laughs> I'll be throwing you under the bus here. Um, well, I, I'm familiar with... Um, there's a there's a, a Vesuvius yeah, okay. in I- Italy. Sure. Um, I think. I've heard of it. Is that in Italy? Yeah. Yes, I believe it is. Is that what I'm thinking of? Yeah. So <clears throat> the the uh, tomatoes that are grown in the volcanic soil uh-huh. at the foot of Mount Vesuvius mm. are like world famous for their flavor. Really? Okay. It's yeah. a huge thing. Okay. And everybody says, it's in the soil, you know? Yeah. It's like it's like New York pizza. It's in the water. It's, it's like, in the water. <laughs> Those Vesuvius tomatoes are in okay. the soil. Yeah. Um, San Marzano. I think that's where the San Marzano's come from. Oh, I see. Um, so my question is, yeah. volcanic soil, what does volcanic soil have in it that helps plants th- really like juice up? Ooh. And does it happen to these trees? That's a good question. I'm I, sorry. That's such a. It's a bit of an in-depth question that yeah, you had no time to prepare for. I had no time. But uh, what's your snap judgment? Well, I know that... In volcanoes, there's like the soil tends to be ashy. And so I can't remember if ash goes, it would, I essentially it affects the pH of the soil. Sure. So I cannot recall uh, as a not, I mean, I grow things, but I don't know the best soil for a tomato. So it might be that it's like very hot because tomatoes like it hot. They want to be like roasted in the sun while they are still cooking. It's well-drained soil, surely, because if it's volcanic, then there's lots of pumicey ash kind of stuff, and water just kind of goes through very quickly. Tomatoes are also very acidic, so I'm wondering if an yeah. acidic soil is good for That's, tomatoes. I'm wondering that, too, because they also developed, uh, they're all from the Andes, which are another volcanic or volcanic mountain chain there in South go. America. That's where tomatoes are originating from? Yeah, oh. they are a South American species, Wow, just like that? potatoes also. Oh. So the fact that the Italians are known for tomatoes. It's a bit of stolen valor. Stolen valor. But, or as we say in italy i can't <laughs> <laughs> so this uh this laurel forest alex yeah is really unique in a couple a couple different ways one thing i was very fascinated by is where they're located mm. they're also somewhat stratus uh, stratified because they're located off of the coast of africa and a little bit further south, like off of Morocco, oh. and even the um, there's kind of this uh, a bunch of these chains. There's the Canary Islands, there's Madeira, there is the Azores, and there are Cape Verde Islands. Just just down the way from Casablanca. Just down the way. We were talking about that movie we earlier sure today. Sure were, but it's on the mind, is what it is. That's right. So all of these zeitgeist. It is. It's Sorry. Zeitgeist. <laughs> I love that. All of these different plants, uh, or all these different islands, have all these unique plants. The islands have never been connected to the mainland because wow. of where they've come from. So everything has come over. I from see. There. That's why the significance of them being volcanic is important because they came up from the crust. Not they didn't break off from the yes, continent. Precisely. Okay. Yeah. So they've come up. Everything has come over there, which means that they've developed in this really like cut off world very isolated yeah. yeah this forest this same kind of laura silva used to go all the way across southern europe northern africa the mediterranean probably as far as almost uh the other side of the middle east wow and you can still find plants growing in this area that you'd be like wait what they have their own species of juniper pistachio the obvious, uh, our Canary Island date palm, yes. which we know of, as well as a draconia or a dracaena, that same dragon tree. I love this. There's sometimes those that are kind of popping up here and there in these like drier forest and these, areas. And these are all branded ca- under the Canary Island name. For the most part, yeah. They also have a an endemic olive species, which is olive seraciformis. I'm sorry, olea seraciformis. You know what I love about this, Casey? What? This reminds me of like, you know, a local, like a boo, like kind of a trendy local restaurant, uh-huh. will be like, "This is our take." Actually, I can think of a perfect example: Canard. Do you know Canard? No, but you've told me about it's it. It's a French place, but they yeah. do they do yeah, a steamed French, uh, French for duck. <laughs> That's right, Casey. Uh, they also own Le Pigeon, which is another bird. Ah, uh-huh. French for <laughs> the pigeon. <laughs> um, they do a they do a little steamed burger. Their take on a White Castle burger, right? Oh, it's I that see. That same style, but it's like. 
their own take on it. Uh-huh. Yeah. So the Canary Island, all these are all like Canary Islands take on, on this. the dragon blood tree. Yeah, that's so good. I love I that. I love it. Well, this is... It's, it's boutique. It's, it is. It's a boutique place. Yeah. And all of these different plants are all stratified up the island as you get from sea level up to like alpine, like, oh. you know, maybe maybe up to 5,000 feet elevation or higher. Okay. Stratified. Yeah, kind so of in rings of growth. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Once you get up to a certain level, the conditions change, and now you have a layer of uh, this kind of forest. I gotcha. Cool. Then you go up, and you have the layer of this kind of forest. So they have like uh, coastal scrubs in a thermophilus forest layer, which is essentially uh, where it gets very hot. So you have these hot, loving thermophilus plants. Oh, and thermophilus. I also learned a word, speaking of uh, phyllis. Wow. Phyllis. Uh, <laughs> Is that your Michael Scott? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> That's great. Uh, ombrophilic. Ombrophilic. Let's yes. see. Ombro, ambro, a m b r o. B-R-O. It starts. It's O M B. O O M B. Yeah. O O M B R O. Is that like ombre, like a like a gradient? I uh, don't believe so. No. Okay. What is this? Maybe it is. I guess I'm not sure. It means it's plants that love to grow where there is a mass amount of rain. Oh. So our temperate rainforest out here is an ombrophilic forest. Wow. So our trees are ombrophilic as well. So you go from the thermophilic forest to the ombrophilic forest. Oh, so ombro is rain. I guess so. Yeah. Oh, like the uh, the effect. What's uh, that effect called? Oh, that's the uh, orographic effect. Oh, not quite. Yeah, a little bit different. Hey, that's, they both start with an O, they, though. They do. They both start with an O. What else do you want from us here? That's what a dumb and dumber want? thing. It's like, I knew it started yeah. with an O. <laughs> that's true. It is. That was I'm way right. off. Well, so these trees all grow up, and then as you get wow. higher, then you get the Canary Island pine, which grows up in this higher oh. area. Oh, pine. Yes, pine. Yeah, oh, Alex, you I'm looked so at me sorry. like I was saying the wrong tree. Uh, I was like, what? <laughs> you're going to catch me saying the wrong tree again. You're good at this. Well, it's, so it's uh, it's this forest. Wow. And so as you go high, you kind of get this, oh, whatever. It's, you know, you get high up, you get pines and junipers, eh, whatever. Okay. You go lower down, and it's kind of more pastures. They've cleared land for agriculture and things. Mm. But right in this certain area, everything is so dense and steep. They're apparently, especially in a national park on Madeira, they protect it as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Wow. A 90% untouched, perfect primary forest of these trees that have not changed in terms of their ecosystem type for at least several hundred thousand years. Oh. Very likely moving more towards the millions. Oh my God. They've just been sitting there as long as these volcanoes came up and I couldn't find an exact date. Uh, someone, one of my sources said that the the islands started to pop up in the Miocene. So between like five and 23 million years ago. Holy shit. It's a pretty big range of time. Yeah. That's but, a chunk. Uh, these trees, because they have been growing on this, this what used to be high very humid area of this what we now think of as like a kind of mediterranean climate like yeah. it defines the climate of like central southern california right. very dry with only certain types of rain a very not humid subtropical forest mm. you know what i mean wow and now so now only this high elevation area on these islands has that forest maintained either a not been cut down yeah. or b the climate has not changed significantly that they've been able to thrive so it's a relic forest that you can find nowhere else on earth for one wow. reason or another kind of just trapped in time it's just trapped in time and alex the best part about this is that it's extraordinary it's not just like yes the forests of pacific northwest are a, a relic there's mm. a bunch of old species and we're like yeah great really cool but it's like you have thousands of miles of these forests all over the place we can, we've cut down most of them it's a tragedy but we still have a bunch left that are really great in these national parks in certain spaces that we haven't cut down. This is such a small amount of land it's that a, has these trees. Yeah, a tiny little space. Now, and it's unique. enough. It's, it's on all these islands, you know, it's several hundred uh, square kilometers. Like, it's not a trivial amount of space. But if you look at, say, Western Oregon and compare it to these islands, mm -hmm. you'll be like, oh, my God, that's vastly different wow. in size. And they're still there. That's they're amazing. still crushing it and they're so unique you can't find trees growing like that even if you take that same tree and you move it somewhere else they don't have the same 
super tall, dense forest yeah. that's very dark. They grow shrubby. Yeah. And there's one other thing, Alex. Hmm. My friends who went there, they said, you got to go. It's, it's amazing. So I said, all right, well, cool. Looked it up. They have what's called a cloud forest. Oh, there. yeah. I love cloud forests. And a lot of this is that same cloud forest because as you go up to a certain elevation, it's subtropical, but you have now the orographic effect where you get a little bit more rain. Yeah. On the north side of most of these mountains is where you find a lot of this really moist, humid, subtropical, dense forest. That subtropical dense forest then has clouds that come in and just sit. They just hang out in the clouds. That's so cool. For a huge amount of time. So much so where you can have like a photographer come out there, wake up in the morning and take like this ghostly image shot. Yeah. Wherever they have had like, you know, sheep or some other grazing animals have come out where they've gone over and they've, they graze all the local small things or maybe they've cleared out the forest, but they've left like individual trees. Mm -hmm. So you can find pictures of these like ghostly looking pasture lands that have one 600 year old laurel tree Uh. just kicking it it's maybe 30 feet tall but it's like this this tiny little monolith and then over there is another monolith and they're like crooked and they've been beaten to hell for wow 100 years most of these trees like these really ancient ones between six and eight hundred years old wow it's this who knew this was here <laughs> the people of the canary islands i guess so yeah um I, yeah that's that's wild casey i i before we go to break i have a kind of a thought experiment yeah 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 how terrified I, I i i think about this forest that has been largely untouched and unchanged yeah. for what you claim to be almost it could be millions of years mm-hmm, mm-hmm. i know that the trees are different they're not yeah. million year old trees right yeah so that's slightly different but i feel like walking into that place i would just become like terrified yeah like it's <laughs> like a primordial so fear yeah, yeah yeah like this is before i I'm, I'm seeing i'm seeing too much i'm like this is this is too mm. the energy is too ancient i mean yeah. it's beyond ancient it's it's primordial i think you're onto something there because you can imagine i feel like your your ancient kind of instinct instincts would kick in a little yeah, bit yeah yeah where you're like oh i remember this forest like you Ooh. yourself you don't but your instinctual sure. ape brain your, remembers it somewhere your ancestral uh your ancestral stuff yeah yeah because this was in that area where you the first human certainly went through forests like this yeah a couple hundred thousand years ago wow then you i would be willing to bet alex are not far off in that your brain is like i remember there's jaguars in here ah. and really poisonous snakes. Uh, maybe that's why I would be afraid. <laughs> yeah, like I think that's exactly it. I mean, yeah. you've heard the theories about like why when you take a uh, like your a fingernails on a chalkboard, mm. like people really have a visceral reaction. Oh, yeah, to that. I don't know. I don't know this theory. Well, people have theorized that is because anciently, way back in the time of humans being like not predators but prey to yeah. certain things where that would be like the screech of a bird or another <gasps> animal oh. that as soon as it happens we'd be like oh shit wow. something, something's here or something's going really wrong i need to react that's interesting and you're just wing right then i i my favorite theory like that is that the reason that you and i love crunchy salty snacks like uh-huh. chips and things pretzel sticks yeah is that um you know, our, our ancestors and many people today, but you and I, it's not a part of our culture to eat insects. Oh, I think you told me this actually. Yeah. yeah. Is that it's, it's reminds our, our ancient brain of uh, eating a little crunchy cricket, a little crunchy cricket. Yep. Mm -hmm. (laughs) A little salty snack. Hey case, we got to go for a break, but that was our discussion of the Canary Island Laurel. We'll be right back with our review of this Laurel right after this. As long as it's uh, as long as it's uh, in uh, Intel from you know where uh, you know or Oregon. That's right. That's what I'm focused. Good on. Good old Oregon-made Intel computer chips. Exactly. <laughs> 
Welcome well, back. <laughs> welcome out to Oregon. We got Yamhill County here, and we just dig right in the ground. You get Silicon Valley chips. It's just like that. Mm-hmm. They come bubbling out of the ground like that black tea. <laughs> well, except it's more like a medium gray with some shiny bits in it. Uh, it's very square in profile. And, and they're hard. They're really, really hard. Uh, welcome back to Completely Arbitrary. Sorry, that was just us imagining that uh, where Intel is outside Portland, they just mine. <laughs> and they just dig in the soil like they're getting potatoes. Yeah, I like the idea of them sifting for them. <laughs> yeah, right? Like panhandles. Uh, just singing a song about the Southland. <laughs> um, welcome back to Completely Arbitrary. We let our we let our uh, we let our uh, break time banter bleed into the episode. That's we fun. Did. It's bad, bad, bad recording, Alex. Bad podcasting. Yeah, we're sorry, everyone. But it's too late now. Uh, that was our discussion of the Canary Island Laurel. Yes, I loved it. Yes, and now it is time. And for, now <laughs> it is time for a review of the Canary Island Laurel. So. Uh, one thing, just before we get into it, wow. I just want to know the fuck? what your opinion is. There's also another name for this that I believe is in Portuguese. <gasps> Exciting. It's Loro. L O. I've seen this, yeah. Okay, you see like it too? I like that. Yeah, I saw it on the on the show notes. Okay, because I was looking at it and I was like, ah, <clears throat> you know, I get it, I like it, but Loro. I, I, I couldn't find another thing and I, I wasn't sure if everyone would get it because I think it might just be Portuguese for Laurel. Oh, okay. But I don't know for sure. There's I like also, it. in Spanish, it's Laurel Canario. Oh, yeah. I also like that. That's what made me say, well, if it's Laurel Canario, that just means it's the Canary Laurel. Yes. But we wouldn't say Canary. It's not, it would be like, it doesn't flow correctly in our brains. We'd be like, the Canary Laurel? What? <laughs> and we'd go think about the birds, and now we go. Yeah. So I, I, th- th- I made that editorial choice. <laughs> I think it's a fine one. Before we get into the review, I just wanted to put that out there. Well, that will weigh into my score. That's why I thought so. And here's how the review works. We're going to give some final thoughts on this tree. And then we're going to give it a rating of 0 to 10 golden cones of honor. Out of pity. Casey. (laughs) Only because we can. As our resident expert, we will begin with you, my friend. Sorry. (sighs) Oh, wow. Casey just took a grand sip of water. I did, Alex, because I need a wet... My palate. Wow. Before I get into this. Let's hear it. I think this is a cool tree. Yeah. But I think that the tree itself Mm. makes the forest, but the forest is the thing that I'm like, what? I feel you. It is home to a huge amount of endemic species. Yeah. The way most like islands that are distant, but not distant too distant but are also just a little too distant are you know that sweet spot it's exactly right so they have this wild amount of trees that are relics of this other this other world this other time you Mm. know and i was trying to imagine as i was trying to conceive of how i'm going to rate this tree how do i want to see this tree i want to see it today and i want to see it as this this gigantic form of a tree that doesn't generally get gigantic right in my associations, that's pretty cool. I like big trees. <laughs> so if you give me a, a, a medium-sized tree that every now and then becomes a big tree, yeah. if you put it in its perfect relic con- conditions and you leave it alone for a couple hundred years, I'm on that. That's for sure. fantastic. Pretty cool. I think the bark is kind of fun, just for no good reason, you know? I like these little warty lenticels. Mm-hmm. It's just kind of enjoyable. Yeah. I like that this is a tree that's not the tree that I thought it was, Twice. Right. I thought this was Loris nobilis, wildly growing. Yep. I then thought, oh no, this is the Portuguese laurel, Prunus lusitanica. It is neither. It's a third thing, and there's now other five different other things that are the same thing that aren't the same thing. I, I, I love that. It's a wild web. Exactly. It's a dream for someone like me who everyone's like, yeah, it's a pine tree. I'm like, well, actually, <laughs> it is a pine tree, but it's a very, spe- you know, I love when... There's all these nuances where everyone else who is probably, if you're a tourist, you're going to Madeira, and they're like, welcome to Laura Silva. This is a laurel. This is a laurel. That's a laurel. Yeah. And then you go to the tropics, and someone's like, yeah, there's a, there's a red mangrove. There's a white mangrove. There's a black mangrove. They're all different. They're all different forms of different trees growing in different ways, but kind of mimic one another. For sure. I like, I like diving into that and looking around and having someone be like, hold on. These are all 
different. You do love a, a good esoteric detail. Yeah, it's yeah, you know, that's a very sweet way to put yeah. something that you could have put very <laughs> Very mean. <laughs> so thank you, Alex. It's never. Um, so I think this is. I think it's a cool tree. But I also like. There's another part of my brain that really wants to imagine Europe. About, let's say, I'm gonna go eighty thousand years ago. Oh, geez. Okay. You're walking through what is now southern France, Spain, North Africa, mm. somewhere in there, and. You have just come up, your your family and your clan, you're migrating from uh, from Africa, you're going up through these new lands because you're, you're hungry and you want to get away from lions and tigers and things like that. Well, maybe not tigers yet. You're actually going into tiger territory, mm. kind of unfortunate, but you know, out of the frying pan, out into the fry. frying pan, into the frying pan. So you walk over and you are just walking through this humid tropical forest, subtropical forest mm-hmm. that has these giant, really strange trees where if you pull off the leaves and you break them, they have this really beautiful smell to it. And there's just like, there's, there's long toed pigeons all over the place. Everything is really weird. Long toed pigeons, by the way, they're a endemic pigeon species to these islands. Oh, cool. Sorry. You know why they call them long-toed pigeons? Do they have long toes? They have one giant long toe. Alex, man, you're good. You're one good. giant long toe? <laughs> it is. I saw pictures. That's it's so just, funny. It's like their middle toe is twice as big as oh, all the rest. Great. It's like a utility toe. It, exactly. It, that's meant for something. It's probably to grab all these funny berries by all the trees that have the exact same berry. It's to open doors, Casey. Yeah. Oh, shoot. <laughs> yeah, this is actually the door opening pigeon. Um, so anyway, I like... Like, I, I just love the idea of walking through a place that we know today is, like, vastly different. Yeah. But imagining what it would have been like for these first, like, you know, maybe it was Homo sapiens, maybe it was Neanderthals or some other people. The people who were drawing those cave ma- markings in Paris or in France. These like 30, 40,000 year old cave paintings. Wow. They were walking through this forest yeah. in all likelihood. Wow. And then as you go north, it becomes this like wild north German kind of big oak trees and beech trees in this crazy forest where the trees are no longer these small spindly things growing tall. They're massive, huge things that are growing tall. Yeah. It's just one of those things where everyone's like, well, if you could ever go back in time, I'm like 30,000 years ago, just before we really ruined things. That is very niche. <laughs> yeah. Just right before. And then some time where everything's so vastly different. Meanwhile. Uh, I'm like, send me to the 40s so I can have a real Coke. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you want. I just really want to feel the zing the way they felt it back then. <laughs> That's uh, it's from Peep Show. I didn't, I didn't make that up. Oh, God. Well, that is, I think, the way I want to conceptualize this tree okay. for our review. Wow, it better be a 10 out of 10. It is not going to be a 10 out of 10 okay. because, you know, it, it has more than one stem. I think that a tree that really has the grandeur will have just a single stem. It will be a monolith unless that single stem has been falling apart or it is like a banyan where it takes up like a hundred yards. Yeah. That I'll give you, I'll give you a buy. Fair enough. But for this tree in this native habitat, in this wild, crazy way that it grows, there's one short tree that's like this ghostly image of a tree in this weird field versus them growing with their homies out in the forest, growing three or four times taller Mm -hmm. in this thing that's like, this appears to be such a unique ecosystem. There's nothing else like it on earth anymore. And this is the tree that makes it up. And they have those funny little glands that make them easy to identify. That is really cool. I'll take that. Yeah. So I'm actually going to give the Loris Novo Canariensis an 8.9. Wow. Right on the precipice of Damn. a 9.0. The reason it doesn't get into the 9.0 yeah. is because there are some <laughs> things that you just compare a grand, huge, massive tree to this. Fair enough. It is. It just doesn't quite get there. That's kind of a. I think that's kind of a compliment to this tree that it's like if it if it if only it just had a big single stem what have you lost oh i lost my hair band but i was playing oh. with it and now i'm focused on you <laughs> if only it's kind of a compliment to this tree i think where like if o- you're as you're at the top of your weight class yes exactly that's you know? a perfect description alex yeah. yes like yes you're amazing but as soon as you go up against a redwood or a bristlecone yeah. pine they're going to stomp you totally. like a bug squashes 
or rather as a person squashes a bug. I guess as a bug squashes a m- mite. I mean, in Starship Troopers, the bugs were certainly oh, squashing people. that's true. Just saying. Okay, good point. Anyway. Okay, uh, 8.9 Golden Cones of Honor. 8.9 is what I'm going to go with. I think that's great, Casey. Pr- uh, Loris Novo oh, Canariensis. The Canary Island Laurel. Alex. <laughs> Can I give this more false weight? Yes. No, no, no. Yeah, no um, I, the, the weight's there. Kind of wish I had some <laughs> false weight. Can I give you... Uh, <laughs> I like this tree. I th- I think I'm right with you, Case. Where I th- I like this tree, yeah. but I love the forest. Uh huh. Did you uh, Did you see some of these pictures? Yeah, of them? it's yeah. it's stunning. And I almost I'm like it's a little unfair. I think because I'm like oh I, it's like how uh, you know racist white people will be like oh I love going to Mexico to eat the tacos, but I don't want to like you know. Talk, talk to, to the, the people. people. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I, I love, I love this forest, you know, it's so, it's so cool to look at. I'm sure I would love being there, you know, for 10 minutes. Um, but the tree is just okay. Wow. Really? So you, you're like this forest, this whole space. Yeah. But the tree itself, you're kind of like, uh, ah, mm. I think I, I, I can see the forest for the trees. <laughs> this is I can't see the trees the for the forest. Yeah. Wow. So, okay. Well, I'm curious where you're going to go from here. Well, I'll just go straight to my score. So sorry, Casey. I'm giving this a 6.0. 6.0. I'm not feeling that passionate about it. The trees make the forest. I understand that. But that's like, you know. Your uh, opinion, man. A painting is not like just made of paint. Okay. Right? Sure. It's like a creative vision. It's mm. saying something more. A forest mm. is not just made of trees. Yeah. Especially it's not just made of this one tree. V- that very explicitly so. Yeah. Okay. So that's kind of where, I, that's where my head's at. Ooh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. I think Follow this, up question. Oh, sh- please. So if we had the, if we, if we were reviewing now. Yeah. Loris Novocanariensis slash Apollonius Babuyana mm-hmm. slash Persia Indica slash Okatia Photons. Uh-huh. Where would you be? I don't answer hypotheticals. Wow. That was our review of the Canary <laughs> Island <laughs> Laurel. It is time for a completely arbitrary Q&A. Man, you're going to do so good on the Supreme Court when they start questioning you. <laughs> Yeah, imagine so saying that to a judge. <laughs> Dude, uh, no, no, no. It's the judges that say it to Senate. Oh, I see. When they're like, are you going to overturn Roe versus Wade? They're like, I don't deal I don't. in hypotheticals. <laughs> uh, Casey, this week, our question comes from the Patreon, as always. And this one comes from John. Hello, John. Hi, John. John hmm. says, if you were going to make a spinoff podcast where you covered a topic each oh. week, what would you be each be interested in? Covering and exploring. Follow up uh, clarification question. Point yeah. of order, Alex. Uh-huh. It can't be about trees. It cannot be about trees. Huh. So now you're really stumped. That's not true. You're not a monolith. You have plenty of hobbies. Yeah, that is true. That is true. But man, do all of them just in some way? Well, we know this. Our podcast is about the fact that everything can come back to trees. Yeah, it's rough. I'll go first, so you okay. have time to muse. I appreciate this. Um, I have attempted to start several podcasts, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, but none of them mm-hmm. has quite clicked in yeah. the way that this, this one just kind of came together really, really easily. We just kind of fell into it, almost. which I think is important to a creative endeavor. You mm-hmm, know, if mm-hmm. it's like, if it's like walking uphill in the snow, it's yeah. like, oh, maybe this isn't the right thing for me yeah, right now. Maybe I don't really want to be doing this. Yeah. Or maybe it's just like not the right time or uh-huh. with the right people or, you know, it's not the right variation of the idea. Yeah. But I've 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 thought about a uh, a podcast with my friend Louie about TV pilots. That's right. I remember the name of that one as well. I mean, I want to say it right here because then someone's going to copy it. Right? Oh yes, that's right. Mm. Um, where we watched pilots of of pilot episodes of TV shows yeah. and talked about you know how is it as a pilot because yeah. a pilot is sort of a unique uh, form. As mm-hmm. opposed to like a mid-season episodic show. Yeah, it's like this is a pilot's the one that you're selling everybody on. Yes. So you're like, here's the entire theme idea. Here's our yes. jokes. Here's our style. That's right. Um, <laughs> and also, I would love uh, a podcast about um, 
my my friend George and I talked about a podcast uh, about let's see uh, video games in alpha. Which in means that, alpha, what does that yeah, mean? Like an indie game, um, an indie game studio when they are making a game, they will put out like a really early version of it uh-huh. for people to play and test. Oh, and they'll say, "Hey, we'd love your feedback. Like, what do you think of it so far?" What features do you want to see? Or did you encounter any bugs? I get it. So this is alpha compared to like, oh, we're doing beta testing. Yes. Gotcha. It's pre-beta. Yeah. Which is pre-release. Yeah. I call it, uh, it's submissive testing. <laughs> is that game going to act up? <laughs> anyway, uh, sorry. I, I make my, <laughs> I make my uh, character name in any game I play, Daddy. <laughs> Oh. Anyway, I love I love playing like really early alpha games because okay, they're yeah, all yeah. made by like dudes like me sitting in their basement, yeah. uh, making a single hey, game. We're not in a basement, Alex. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're dudes um, like you in their own basement. I see. Yes, I see. Uh, but those are yeah, those are my like my big interests: music, TV, uh, and um, uh, uh, video games. Yeah, and then now trees. <sighs> Okay. Casey, have you been thinking? You've been listening pretty intently. I've been trying to listen, yeah. Yeah. But I've also been taking some time to be like, what are the things that I like that aren't trees explicitly? You have kind of like your your big like cornerstones yeah, of it, your hobbies. I like bicycling yep. quite a bit, but the the thing about bicycles and biking is that I don't like I never have gotten into it the way like my roommates, for instance. Mm. They bike everywhere. All the time. I, I used to. I still do. But now I actually like have to do like 10 things at once. It's like, take all of these things and this all these boxes over to here. Right. Send those. Pick up stuff from Alex's place. Go back to my place. Go grocery shopping if everything works out well. And then finally get back home. It just makes more sense to drive sometimes. It does, yeah. Because I'm too, doing like 10 different things at once. Are they like hardcore like cycle enthusiasts? Like yeah. they have the, the gear all oh, over their yeah. bodies? Not like gear in the way that you're thinking. Yeah. But gear like, yeah, I have rain gear if I'm riding in the rain. And I have like five, 10 different bikes depending on what it is I'm doing. Wow. And also don't own cars or own cars and drive them only if thou shalt must drive. Like I you're see. going to California kind of thing. So it's one of the two. Even then. So I really like biking, but I don't I don't have it as such a high like interest where I can talk about trees backwards and forwards for hours. Yeah. Most people might be aware of this by now. But you just like to ride a bike. Exactly. It's not like you're really fascinated by cyclists. Exactly. And, and, the, cycles. and, the, and the making of them yeah. and all the brands and how they fit together. I got lots of friends who are into that. So I don't think I could do it about bikes. Um, I like Frisbee, but same thing. Yeah. I'm not like someone who is like dialed into everything about it. What are the moves? How do you analyze this? Like I can barely tell what another team is doing on the field that is if it's out, out of the ordinary. Other people are like so <laughs> like, you know, like the soccer analyzers where they just they see the people on the field. And they're yeah. like, yeah, they're in a four, four, three. They're going to be doing this, blah, blah, yeah. blah, whatever. My thing is uh, everybody will react to something. I'll be yeah. like, I don't even know what you guys are reacting acting to yeah right 442 <clears throat> just in case anyone's listening they heard me make that gaff oh shit <sighs> see it went right over my head right yeah see my most everybody's hopefully too <laughs> um but you know what i really like if i was to make a podcast it would unfortunately have to be a little bit about trees and as a side bit it would probably be more of a um probably honestly urban design and uh, also like how like a more, I guess it would be technically phil- philosophy, hmm. but I really like uh, historically, especially. And even now, if you kind of get me started on it, I kind of like start gearing into it or like gearing up is not the term, but I start revving. That's it. That's yeah. my car now. Gee. <laughs> um, the so I really like a uh, a well-designed space. Yeah. And I like critiquing spaces that are not well designed cool and i don't mean this in a way that i'm like oh your apartment alex if you move this over here you'd really have you know not like that kind of space like i mean an outdoor space like a city neighborhood what's the difference between a the the city of portland and i mean literally almost the entire city Mm -hmm. versus the exurbs the suburbs outside of the city what are the differences between those things 
Yeah, or or between the city of Portland and the city of Denver. Exactly. And which well, which functions better as a city? Right, and why? And, and why? What makes it better? Obviously, you, New York <clears throat> has this whole thing to it. It's like become a cultural thing in and of itself. Like you can hate New York and you'll still remember it as this wild, amazing place because the culture is such that it's a wild and amazing place. Yeah. I try not to do that no matter where I go. Like, and if I do go someplace, I try to see the beauty in it because mm-hmm. I think it's helpful to understand, uh, I don't know, just understand a place and be able to see, oh, this is why people live here. Yeah. You know, I mean, that it, kind of thing? It, was, it was designed on purpose. Every place is like made intentionally. Yes. You know, and I love to figure out what that intention yeah, was because most of the time it's not good. Historically, at least since maybe the 1940s and 50s, we really geared towards cars and car development. Yeah. Freeways are obviously the thing. Um, but um, I like that. But then also talking about like, well, how did we get to this place? You know, why are we driving cars the way we're driving cars? And a lot of these things come into like religion. I like to understand how religion has affected mm-hmm. all these things because that's a cultural force that has affected almost everything in the world. Certainly Which, in the United States. Yeah. And this is also like, you know, why I talk about Rome all the time? And apparently, I'm not the only one to be like, yeah, well, you could trace almost everything in much of our culture back down to Rome. Mm. Not everything. Don't don't take that that way. Rome and other related topics? Rome and other related topics, which is just, hey, here's this thing that they did in Rome and how you can see it today. <laughs> Alex, that would be such a great podcast. Yeah, yeah I totally listen to that. I've got an idea for your uh, exterior design podcast, or your, yeah. your, your urban design podcast. Okay. You sit down with um, somebody who is like, an interior designer who has more of like mm. a, a visual design focus, uh-huh. you know, like color and shape and stuff. Yeah, yeah, texture. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then you guys sort of like critique a space. Oh, it's gonna be like a video yeah. podcast, you know? See, that would be great. I would like to do that as a uh, almost we're getting a tour, you know? Like, yeah. all right, we're gonna be dropped into this park in this city. Sure. Or we're gonna look at this neighborhood. Or we're gonna say, let's look at this whole city and like see how they drove that freeway right through there. These are the disconnects that they created and these are the ramifications through the neighborhoods. Yeah. I think that would be great. There's there yeah you could do, you could I mean you could do it all on Google Maps yeah shit. you could and that's what a lot of people do with aerial shots in Google Maps yeah and they could say look how shitty this city is now <laughs> like Detroit what used a to be, shithole uh, exactly oh man what I, I do I what is it I follow it is called cars destroyed our cities oh yeah and I love following them because they're just like so viciously showing photos and they point out in like color in like kind of a red shade two buildings in the old photos mm. and they point them out and say, this is this building. This is this building. And you look at the photo beneath and they've matched them up oh, in terms wow. of scale and cool. angle. Yeah. So you're like, Oh, I see there's the same two buildings, but then one has this giant cut of concrete and pavement and w- something that is dedicated strictly and exclusively to cars. That's neat. And then you can say, wow, look at all those buildings and the houses and the design. And then look at this. The None of those things except for the design. And the design is by an engineer, not somebody who's looking at it. No offense, engineers. I love you. I work with you often. But not like an anthropologist. Not, not like an architect who's designing something something and or a landscape architect who says okay we what are we doing our purpose is to get people around Mm. and we want this space to be nice for people to live in and we want it to be organized and understandable your roads all go out like this and they all do this hey you know versus a freeway where the engineers are like well to make it like this we're gonna need this much room and it needs to be banked at this angle and it needs to be big this is the power of teamwork, Casey. I know now we're we're very off topic, but this is this is the power of teamwork in that, you know, if you get one engineer to design something, they'll design it like an engineer. But if they work with an architect, then they will design it like an architect and an engineer. If yeah. you add an interior designer in there, then you've really got something yeah, going. Yeah, now on. you got someone who's like, "Okay, now let's let's make this a human scale." Thing. Yeah, and just yeah. something that's nice to be around and look at. Yeah, that yeah, exactly. also works really well. And if you can get all of them together and they'll redesign the entire United States, I'm for it. Hell yeah. So, there you go. We need to do, you know, like those uh HGTV shows where they'll have oh, like yeah. a team of 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 people like, "I'm a construction worker." I'm an interior designer. And we... Uh, yeah, they all get together <laughs> yeah, and like yeah, yeah, work yeah. on one thing. We need to do that with the United States of America. Get four <laughs> celebrity designers. 
Oh, Ty to Pennington. Fix this country. He's doing it. <laughs> We're gonna move, move that <laughs> space shuttle. Uh, it's just a satellite <laughs> space shuttle moves. Yes. We're actually. We're actually pretty far away. We can't see too much of the detail, but God, the whole thing's different. They get a they get a skydiver sponsored by Red Bull to take a giant photo yeah, of it. See, that's what I'm talking about, Alex. Amazing. Anyway. Well, man. there you go. There are our <laughs> podcast ideas. Please don't steal any of them. Yeah, and also, uh, uh, we're so sorry for... Uh, you give us an opportunity to not talk about trees, and we're like, ooh, something else. Yeah, it's it's funny how it spirals out of control. It I'll does. probably have edited it a little bit. Nah. Uh, if you have a question for us, join up on the Patreon. It is the best way to support this podcast. If you get to the end of your month and think, hey, you know what? Casey and Alex have brought me uh, five bucks worth of entertainment and education consider joining the Patreon. It's patreon.com slash arbitrary pod. That's A-R-B-O-R-T-R-A-R-Y pod. We have a bunch of different uh, tiers on there for it's a monthly subscription to help support the podcast and you get something in return. Of course, the flagship of our Patreon is the Cone of the Month Club. That's right. Where we get an independent illustrator every month to illustrate a tree cone. And we get it on a sticker. We print out a info card with some inf- interesting information on that on that uh, cone. <laughs> I almost said sticker, and we <laughs> send it to you in the mail every month. It's something to look forward to. You build your own little cone collection, and you get a bunch of other bonuses, including access to every past cone sticker we've All ever had of the cones. That's right, Casey. Alex, what another just wildly enjoyable time. You know what? I agree, my friend. Well, thanks. People won't know this, but uh, we stopped down in the middle of this recording to do a live stream. and Which I, you should, should get involved with. You should definitely should get involved. That's on the Patreon, too. And uh, I feel like it put us in a very silly mood. I'm, I'm extremely hungry and thirsty. Mm, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what's gotten you silly. Well, you know what? You I'm lightheaded s- in a yeah. hungry way. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Completely Arbitrary. We will see you next time. Goodbye. See you later. Completely Arbitrary is produced by Alex Croson and Casey Clapp. Our artwork is by Jillian Barthold, and our music is by Aves and the Mini Vandals. And you can support the podcast at patreon.com slash arbitrarypod. And find additional readings at completelyarbitrary.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>